Greetings, everyone. Afrostorian here. I am bringing you a monster of a subject that I hope you will enjoy. We are going to be looking at the history of one of the most notable empires in West African history, the Songhai Empire. Now, this empire tends to be only eclipsed in notoriety by the Mali Empire, but in fact, the Songhai will have a much greater reach and territory than its predecessors possessed. The empire would grow out of its humble beginnings in what would be known as the country of Mali and would end up having territories in the modern day countries of Niger, Nigeria, Mauritania, Guinea, Gambia, and Senegal. Chapter 1 Basis for the Empire Before we get into the Songhai Empire itself, we need to lay down the background for the empire, and that begs the question of who or what are the Songhai themselves? Well, you would find that it is not as simple as one would assume. You see, while Songhai is now considered an ethnic group today, it has not always been so, nor has it always been a specific language. The Zama people, found in many parts of West Africa, have a language that would almost be considered the twin of the modern-day Songhai dialects. However, the two cultures refuse to believe that they are related to each other. Interesting to note is that Songhai, or Songhai, is also the name of a type of caste stratification system established by elites, and so there will be Songhai kings and rulers long before there will be a Songhai empire. Other groups of people that speak the language of the Songhai also do not call themselves Songhai, such as the Isawagen people. Nomenclature aside, the Songhai caste system works as such. All vocations must be hereditary, and all marriages in Songhai society must be of the endogamous, which is defined as marrying within one's own social group, variety. The exception to this, of course, as there were, were priests, called Zima in their culture, who had to be initiated and verified to perform the proper religious rites. Though priesthood was certainly a form of upward social mobility for a family, in the writings of Jean Pierre Olivier de Sardin, each caste had its own representative guardian spirit. Slaves were their own caste, but they could be emancipated after four generations of service. Another exception to the caste system that would have also required initiation were sohances, which in English would best translate as the word sorcerer. The next thing to consider is what made a small Songhai kingdom eventually become one of the largest empires in African history. As dull as it may sound, it would have been in fact the environment. Kingdoms do not just plant themselves anywhere. Where you build your nation must be strategically considered. Climate affects even how one constructs their buildings. So let's just take a quick dive into the environment that the Songhai people lived in. The area of pre-imperial Mali that the early Songhai peoples lived in, when they first settled in the area around 5000 BCE, would be considered extremely hard to form a consistent life for large civilizations. Parts of the land are either arid or semi-arid and receive less than 10 inches or 250 millimeters of rainfall per year. During the dry season, temperatures can go as high as 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 degrees Celsius. Vegetation can either be sparse, as seen in deserts, or it would be like the African savanna, where most species of tree would be few and far between. Some of the available trees would be the infamous baobab trees, with its ridiculously hard fruits, dangerous acacia trees that would either stab you, poison you, or command ants to attack you. That was not a joke. Fan trees might provide you with shade, 
but the land would mostly be covered in bushes. You might get some solace during the short rainy season. Grasses and seeds of Joshua trees and other species of large plants will spring up, which some of the Songhai people would put away in storage to avoid famines. The more savanna-like areas have sheer butter trees, the extract of which is used for more than just a moisturizer, but is also edible when manufactured that way, and is sometimes used as a butter alternative, hence the name shea butter. If you think you might have an easier time in the more savanna-like regions of Mali in this time period, you would still have to deal with lions, hyenas, and other wildlife endemic to the African savanna. More humid areas are awash with seise flies that are dangerous to livestock, and while there will be some pools of water that will spring up now and then, most will go underground and require the building of wells. So, based on all these factors, how on earth is a civilization supposed to spring up in this area? In fact, what allowed so many kingdoms to rise? The main answer is the Niger River. The Niger River, known to the Songhai as Isa, begins in the highlands of southern Guinea and continues on a 2,600 mile or 4,180 kilometer journey through Mali, parts of Benin, Niger, before finally joining up with the Benue River in Nigeria. Interestingly, by the point the river Niger reaches where some of the most famous empires, such as the Mali, Gao, and Songhai would form, there is a large increase in evaporation, providing a lot of much needed humidity to the surrounding landscape around that river. A boon for humans having to deal with the aforementioned high temperatures. The water is extremely clear and low in silt content because of the low silt of the Guinea Highlands and floods consistently from September to May, making it just as consistent as the Nile River in Egypt. In fact, the Niger River is the third largest river in Africa, and it is no secret that the river's name would be an inspiration for naming conventions when the countries of Niger and Nigeria were made. It also happens to be one of the most unusual rivers, having a largely boomerang shape. This is because, millions of years ago, it used to be two separate rivers that would end up fusing together over time. This unusual happenstance saved the human cultures that fled the Sahara when it went from a large savanna plain to the desert we know today 5,500 years ago, and is believed to have been one of the major forces that forced the humans in the area to domesticate some of the local wildlife. The main point of the Niger River is that because of the benefits it provides to the shoreline, and that it is always consistent, it is a good source of drinking water, and especially it provides succor to a plant known as the burgu plant, which, while a favorite delicacy of hippos, can also be fed to horses, cattle, goats, and many other animals, and it grows extremely quickly allowing farms to have large herds that they can control and, more importantly, sustain. The consistency of the river cycle allows for agriculture to occur in an area that would normally be barren. As for the formation of buildings, while, yes, trees were sparse in the area around the Songhai people, the people had an ingenious alternative to cutting down lots of trees to build houses. The people of this land, Look to the soil, which, due to its history of once having been part of a green savanna before its eventual desertification, was full of a mineral known as laterite. Laterite is a mineral rich in iron and aluminum that can be easily extracted, but laterite soil can easily be made into bricks for building. Compared to other compounds used to make bricks, Lateritic soil is extremely cohesive and takes a lot less time to mold, meaning construction time can be cut down significantly. Another great resource for the Songhai was the Kal-Ikhitrat tree, 
more commonly known as the dry zone mahogany tree. The wood was extremely well suited for the building of sturdy boats, and with rivers teeming with fish, rich in both protein and iron, provided by the fish consuming deposits of lateritic soil, the Songhai people were not want for food. With them being so close to a large river, trade was easy to come by, as they could just sail to the other cultures formed along the Niger River. Archaeological digs show evidence of advanced civilizations as early as 250 BCE, with pottery and marks of large iron production industries. More evidence that has come to light shows a world dotted with small city-states along the river, with nomadic tribes of Fulani herdsmen and hunters trading with the established cities, and sunken boats found in the river show that river trade was active and already bustling large amounts of goods being shipped from place to place. This will be complemented by Tuareg traders in the first millennium CE bringing goods from faraway places such as Rome, Egypt, Greece, and many other Mediterranean cultures along the Trans-Saharan Highway. By the time we get to the later empires of this region of West Africa, there is already a thriving iron industry that starts to have goods shipped along the Niger River. The trade with subgroups of Fulani herdsmen such as the Futa Jalan would have made their goods be known far and wide, and control of this industry is what would eventually allow powerful dynasties to appear long before the Songhai is even a gleam in the eyes of history. One of these dynasties that will come up later in this podcast is the Za or Zuwa dynasty, who will be attributed as the main founders of the Songhai Empire. While this further delays how soon we can get to the Songhai themselves, it is important to get the full regional context of the people of the land themselves. There will have to be certain tribes that we can take a look at, so that when they inevitably come up in the subject of this podcast, there would already be context, and no one will be surprised as to where these people suddenly came from. According to the book, Timbuktu and the Songhai Empire, by John Hunwick, the people in this region can be categorized according to their main type of lifestyle, which was influenced, of course, by how close they were to the river or the desert. The Fulani, as prior mentioned, were some of these herdsmen, leading great caravans of cattle to collect food. They are the most well-known, but they are by no means the only group in this region. You also have the Berbers, or the Imazihen, as they called themselves, with the largest subgroup of these Berbers being the Sanhaja. When we later go through this podcast series, you will hear mention of the Hassaniya Arabs. These will also be Berbers from the Maghreb region of North Africa, which in most Eurocentric history books will be known as the Barbary States. The various Berber groups themselves have a long, rich, and storied history dating back, according to archaeological remains, as far back as 10,000 BCE. But that is a story for several other podcasts. Another notable group that will be in this region will be a group of people known as the Tuareg. A lot of these nomadic tribes, especially the Tuareg and the Berbers, are important because they provide the future empires access to the greater Mediterranean, East African empires, and trade networks that will reach as far as ancient India. This would be through a famous trade network known as the Trans-Saharan Trade Network, which tendrilled its way across northern, western, and eastern Africa, never going to central Africa likely due to the unbelievable density of the Congolese forests. These nomads would be responsible for helping the famous explorer Ibn Battuta in his journey to the Mali Empire. More urban ethnic groups that we will come across would be the Hausa, the Mande, and the Zerma. A lot of the Hausa today are split right down in the middle between the modern nations of Niger and Nigeria thanks to the scramble for Africa, but they would have their own kingdoms and states close to this region of Mali, and would often work as traders. 
The Mande themselves can be broken down into smaller subgroups with different identities. I bring this up because the Songhai will sometimes interact with some Mande subgroups and not others at times, so it would be wrong to paint a broad picture of the Mande. The most important of these Mande groups will be the Soninke group, followed by the Malinke, Bambara, and Dula, as well as the Soko on occasion. The Yoruba will also pop up from time to time an ethnic group that will later be famous for their wars with the Dahomey Empire of Benin and forming their own large empire between Nigeria and Benin. There is actually debate with regards to what ethnic group the Songhai themselves are truly a part of. This problem stems from the writer Leo Africanus assigning the language to large portions of West African culture, such as the Gao. Despite this being highly unlikely, to have occurred during the 1400s when the Mali Empire was still around. The Songhai language itself seems to have been a trade language, commonly spoken by merchants along the banks of the Niger itself. Current archaeological discussion seems to point the origins of the Songhai people themselves as being a branch of the Soko. These proto-Songhai, as we shall temporarily call them, seem to have expended their influence westward along the river Niger. There are records of them subjugating smaller agricultural settlements, likely for control and trade in the area. One of the most important kingdoms in this area during the 400 CE was a kingdom known as Kukia. This kingdom, which will survive into the medieval period, will come up a few more times, but it is one of the places thought to be where the Songhai language family really takes off. There are dissenting but valid opinions, like author Christopher Eret's analysis of the language, possibly showing the language becoming more common in the Niger River area as early as the 6th millennium BCE. Other Arabic writers would try to claim a Yemeni origin from the Songhai people with the advent of Islam. This seems to have been done to legitimize the Songhai as being Islam-inspired and worthy of all the tax trade breaks that occurred between Islamic caliphates, kingdoms, and empires at the time. Chapter 2 Land of Empires While the Songhai Empire is going to be the largest physical empire in West Africa, it was not the first, nor would it even be the second. Before the Songhai people would settle in the town of Gao, off the banks of the Niger River at the Telemsi Valley, there are going to be two main players in the story that come up much earlier. The first would be the Wagadao Empire, and later the Mali Empire, which the Songhai would have a terse relationship with. Research also tells us that the people the Songhai traded with did not call Gao by its Songhai name. Rather, it was known as the, in the trade tongue as Kaka or Kuku. It should be stressed that Gao's location was a highly strategic one, being located right along the Niger River, a gigantic river that could facilitate trade from the Limba tribes in Sierra Leone to the Ijaw tribes in modern Nigeria. It was also located near some gold mines that made it extremely valuable for the Trans-Saharan trade. Archaeological data also seems to point to Gao being established somewhere around the 7th century CE. Written records of it, however, come from much later centuries. A minor point that would help its power were the horses it had. While this might not seem impressive, for those versed in animal husbandry, it is the breed that matters. In this particular case, the local horses that the Gao had used were interbred with the much more physically powerful Barbary horses, which created a mixed breed that could adapt well to harsh conditions and still be extremely powerful. One other settlement that we need to keep in mind of before our story continues is the rise of a famous city known as Timbuktu. Current research indicates that while Timbuktu started out as a mere seasonal settlement, along the river for tradespeople, 
It was the Sanhaja people who made the city what it would initially become. The Sanhaja were a confederation of Berbers, one of the larger ones, in fact. They appear to have come down from the northern Sahel of Africa, thanks to their alliance with the Almoravid dynasty, which was busy messing up the power structure of the Ghana Empire, also known as the Wagadao Empire. The progenitors of the Zama people, the Zua dynasty, also was gained in strength around this time. This was the dynasty that ruled Gao, and some of their rulers will be mentioned here and there, but it is important to establish their background as well. The Zua dynasty would end up under the control of the successor to the Wagadao Empire, that being the Mali Empire. The Mali Empire was able to take note of the Gao Kingdom, due in part to how the Zua dynasty had been prospering economically and the trade between Kukia and Gao itself. The Gao Empire, as it is sometimes known as well, called forth its access to the river trade that would attract the attention of Mali. The people within Gao that became successful between the 8th and 10th centuries were primarily craftspeople and artisans. One of the most well-recorded exports that the Gao produced were carnelian beads. This made the Gao a major artisan manufacturing center for its day. This industrial base was able to become extremely wealthy, which allowed it to finance a decent military force in order to absorb many of the small towns and villages that were surrounding it. With an increased amount of power in its little area around the Niger River, the Gao Empire now had more access to resources that it could export, more than just its famous carnelian beads. They could now trade in gold, salt, ivory, and leather. Salt was one of the more important factors that gained scrutiny for Mali, as the Mali Empire would not likely have tolerated a rising competitor in its economic dominance of salt, and the Malians would likely have wanted access to the salt mines of Gao to secure their economic monopoly of the resource. At first, the Malians were simply another trading partner for the Gao. Even better for the Malians was that the Zua dynasty seems to have been at least fully Islamic by the early 1300s. Whatever may have caused the shift in attitudes, it was apparent that Mali needed the resources and economic trade that both Gao and Kukia had to offer, so they marshaled their armies and swiftly encircled and engulfed the Gao Empire. It seems that in order to consolidate power and likely to prevent constant rebellions, the Mali Empire allowed the Zua dynasty to continue, but only in the form of a tributary power. Records from the Malian coffers show that they would continue to receive tax and trade revenue from the remnants of the Gao Empire well into the 1430s. The Malian rule over what will become the Songhai people was noted even by famed explorer Ibn Battuta when he would make his famous set of voyages. Whatever the case, their presence initially drove away many of the Songhai out of Kukia and Gao. There would still be the occasional rebellion, but nothing too hard for the Malian forces to put down. For a time, it seemed that the grip of Mali could not be broken over the region, until, as luck would have it for the Songhai people, the Mali started to be affected by that problem every monarchy-based system tends to have a terrible ruler. This ruler in question, Mari Jata Kieta II, would take actions that would end up bankrupting the empire, forcing his successor to primarily focus on restoring the economic ability of the empire while losing several of its holdings. The main rulers of the local Songhai tribes, known as Sunnis, smelled blood in the water. They were not the only ones as the Takeda Kingdom in modern-day Niger would make their attacks near Gao, Kukia, and even Timbuktu, further weakening the Malians' hold on the region. One Sunni 
known as Sunni Ali Kulun, would try by 1435 to start a revolt in Gao, while the Malians were fighting off the nearby Tuareg tribes. By 1438, the Malians had lost control of the great city of Timbuktu, a clear indicator that they were no longer the great superpower of West Africa. The Sunnis, for their part, were able to retake Gao and establish their own control over the region, solidifying their power under the rule of Sunni Suleiman Dana, who turned his attention to other territories like Mena that had also broken away from Malian control. Suleiman Dana would ensure the prosperity of Gao and start a new dynasty from the ashes of the Zua dynasty, known as the Sunni dynasty. In 1464, Suleiman would pass on, leaving everything to his successor, Sunni Ali Bear. Sunni Ali would have great ambition as he felt that it was time that the Songhai people had a higher podium on the West African theatre.